Wow. Wow. This episode, there are no words really that, that could describe this episode that can give this episode justice. I would definitely say this is probably in the top five or even possibly top three of the best episodes in the entire series so far. Um, there wasn't a wasted moment this episode. Everything was coming at you hard, straightforward, and we at least have one storyline totally wrapped up that gave way to possible numerous other storylines in this week. So we're going to begin this off with the storyline involving Lagatha, Aslog, Ube, Sigurd, and Astrid. So as we ended last week, Lagatha is now face-to-face with a- with Aslog. And Aslog says to Lagatha, I wouldn't expect something like this from you. You know, isn't it kind of wrong, you know, this whole woman-to-woman beef, you know? And Lagatha's like, listen, it doesn't matter the fact that you're a woman or not. You know what I mean? And I believe Aslog said before she said that, that the whole woman-to-woman thing, but also the fact about how about how it's that like the it's it's kind of ironic that like that it doesn't make sense that like the you know would want to be the usurper and like the let's ask like no listen I haven't always been the usurper and I'm not even the usurper I mean usurper I mean usurper I've always been the usurped and when you when she says that we kind of are thinking about the whole thing with Calf. How Calf sort of usurped her, and then she had to kill Calf because of that, and so on and so forth. But she also says that it doesn't matter, like I mentioned before, it doesn't matter if you're a woman or not. That doesn't really, I don't really give a shit, essentially. That you took away my husband, my home, and my life, and I want it back. And Aslog pretty much has a few lasting words, but kind of true in a sense depending on your point of view, saying that, listen, I didn't take your husband. Your husband chose me. And Latha's like, no, you're a witch. You bewitched him. And like, and Aslog laughs in a sense, well, kind of smirks. She says, you know what? Believe what you want to believe. But regardless of how this day is gone, I have already fulfilled my duty. I've fulfilled my legacy. And when it comes to the saga of Ragnar, I'm just as important and vital as you are. Like the, I gave him the sons that he needed. Another shots fired at Lagtha. You could tell Lagtha was really feeling some type of way just by her facial expression. And she also said, um, pretty much gave away. I, no, not that. She she mentioned the fact that she's seen that Ivar and Ragnar died in a shipwreck. And Lagtha's like, you don't know that. She keep on saying that. You don't know that. And I was just like, I see it in a dream. And then I was like, who gives a shit? You don't know that. And I was like, sort of thinks to herself, she's like, you know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe Ivan Ragnar died. But nonetheless, I want free passage. You can have your home back. And she kind of throws the sword disrespectfully. <laughs> so just like, she didn't want to hand like this, the sword. She just threw it at her. At that point, I was expecting Ra- Lagatha just to run up on her and beat the shit out of her and then kill her. But Lagatha was cool, calm, and collected. She heard out what the rest of Azark had to say. And now so I was like, I want safe passage to go wherever the gods want want me to go or intend for me to go and protect and don't seek vengeance on my sons. And that was that. And Lagatha's like, all right, you got your wish. And she sort of parts the way for her. So as soon as Aslog gets at least 30 feet away from Lagatha, Lagatha shoots her in the back with an arrow. And Aslog falls, her face hits the puddle of mud. And that's that. That's a wrap, folks. The, the wicked witch is dead. <laughs> and yeah, and when I saw that, I wasn't expecting that to go down. I was expecting Aslog to at least put up a fight. Well, or at least like the to, you know, just beat the shit out of her for all the, the bullshit and the frustration that she's been dealing with over at least the past two decades or so with the whole birth of 
Ube, Vic Cirque, Sigurd, and, and Ivar, and Aslog's tyrannical reign uh, for the past 10 years since Ragnar has been out of commission. But I wasn't expecting that from Lacta. I wouldn't necessarily say cowardly, but I didn't think that was very characteristic of Lagatha. Lagatha always has been sort of like, if I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna. Just, I want you to see that I'm that I'm, I'm about to kill you. I'm gonna kill you. you know what I mean, like right before you die, you know, you you bow down to the bigger, you know, mofo shit like that. She did the shit with Cal. She did that with Cal. She killed him, um, <laughs> literally face to face. And let's not start with. Earl Sigvard, I believe, when she stabbed him through the eye. But I guess, you know, Aslog, as Lacta said, she doesn't really consider Aslog a worthy queen and doesn't respect her as a warrior. And let's be honest here, Aslog was never a warrior. She's pretty much a breeding machine. So I guess that would lack the, like, one last fuck you saying, you know what, you don't even deserve for me to kill you honorably. You're nothing. So... In regards to that, the next thing we have, um, Aslog's funeral, um, sort of is very similar to Earl, um, Earl Harrelson's funeral, except obviously on a much larger scale, you know, her body is like pretty much on a boat, they've given her all types of gifts for the afterlife, then we see a few of the archers shoot, um, arrows of fire that sets the boat ablaze as it's going straight through the water, and, excuse me, we see Lagatha and Astrid watching this procession, and Lagatha is smiling. Like, like I said before, she's clearly, as we all know, she doesn't respect Aslog, you know what I mean? But she was just, like, smiling, like, I finally killed this bitch. I've been waiting 20 years for this shit. And, ironically, while this is going on, Margaret comes and lets Ube and Sigurd free. And as soon as she opens the door, Ube grabs her and said, where is Lagatha? And Margaret says, you guys best go back to Cadigan. And Sigurd's like, what happened in Cadigan? Well, the next thing we see, Ube and Sigurd pretty much on their horses, and they're just arrived in Cadigan. And they come to the Great Hall to see that Lagatha is sitting on their mother's throne, and Lagatha is now the queen which the seer had foretold. And... Ube is like, where's our mother? And Lactus like, I killed her. <laughs> and Ube's like, why? And Lactus like, because she took my world, she took she took my husband. It was it was pretty much I had to do. It. I had no other choice. And Sigurd's like, why didn't you have us killed? And Lactus like, because this has nothing to do with you guys. You guys couldn't help the fact that, you know what I mean, that you were born essentially by a witch and that your father was bewitched by a witch. And this shit set Uber off. Uber literally was like, you should have killed us when you had the chance. And Lactha was like, that's the risk I was willing to take. So, now, when she said that in her facial expression, especially when Ube pretty much pushed his cigarette out of the way and he just goes ham. He starts taking out mad fucking soldiers. And this, I was, as I'm watching him, like, you know what? Ube is definitely like his father. The way he just went about it, like the ferocity and the quickness. And, you know, I'm seeing how vicious Ube is. So it makes me wonder if Ube is this vicious, just how vicious is Vixer? Because apparently, um, Vixer is more of the fighter of the brothers, even more so than Ube. And then we all know what Ivar is capable of. And it just, it's just, it's just so like, it's, you know, it was just crazy how, how vicious Ube was. He was taking, he was kicking ass, taking names. At one point, this dude was getting punched and it seemed like he was enjoying it. Like he, like he thrived on it. And you see Lagda not flinching for her facial expression. Like, she truly felt sorry and guilty for what she had done to their mother. But, like, Lagda doesn't have a character. Once she makes up her mind, that's that. And also, we understand that these are, like I said before, these are the children of her, of the Lord for life, Ragnar. So, she's, 
she obviously not just, it's not just because they're Ragnar, um, not just because of Ragnar. She obviously still cares about the kids as well as individuals, in my opinion. Because she never hated them. But, um, yeah. So, it makes me wonder, is Lagtha expecting one of the sons to kill her? Because she said, literally, that that was a chance that she was willing to take. So, I feel as though she knows her days are numbered. Because she knows her husband is vengeful. And those and these are her ex-husbands. You know, she knows that these are her sons. And she knows they're just like their father. So, I'm expecting that she knows her days are numbered. So, she's just trying to enjoy as much of this reign as possible. So, anyway, we have the next scene in which Ube has one eye shut. And he's like, yo, let's go to the Great Hall. Let's finish this broad. And Sigurd's like, nah, you're going to do this alone, bro. This is stupid. Our, our mother would not have done what you have done for us. All she cared about, all she cares about is Ivar and Hobbit. And then Ube is like, what are you talking about? He's like, you should have seen it. She, oh, she loved Hobbit. She loved him. And then Ube is like, and then, no, Sigurd's all like, you should have seen it. It was pathetic. And Ube's like, listen, I did see it. And when he met by, he did see it because we have to remember season three, that's when Hobbit arrived while Ragnar, Athelstan, Rolo, Lactan Company were over at Wessex helping Queen Quintith with the armies of Mercia and Wessex at the same time. So um, he remembers. Remember, him and Victor almost drowned and Siggy had to save them. So that's what he meant, referencing back to, um, to that particular time frame. So Sig was like, do you think that, you know, he was a god. And Ube is like, Ube is like, no. He only took advantage. Because, as everyone knows, Ragnar and Azar didn't have the best marriage, so he just took advantage. And Sigurd says something, I feel, I feel that this episode really did show more of Sigurd's inner turmoil, in which he said that his mother, to him, his own mother felt like a stranger. Like, it's like, out of all the kids, she, um, really, you know what I mean? Like, it was like a stranger thing. Like, they had no connection whatsoever. But Ube is like, listen, it doesn't matter whether she's a witch or not, whether it's Harvard the guard or not, whether she loves Ivar or not, she's still our mom. And Lacta has to pay for this shit. And the next scene after that, we they wake up and it's Astrid. And Astrid is all watching them. I always thought Astrid was kind of weird, kind of creepy. But in a fun, like, you know, cheeky kind of way. So she says that she wants to change her look. And that she wants to be friends with the sons of Ragnar Lothbrook. And she also gives sort of a veiled threat. Saying that if any of them try to touch her hair on Lagda, That they would be dead. And that they should be afraid. And Ube, and, <laughs> Ube, and Ube is like, listen. If I ain't afraid of life, the little girl, why should I be afraid of you? And then he proceeds to throw a cup at her as she walks, as she tries to exit the room. And then she comes back and stares at him. So, this is interesting. I remember in one of my videos, I thought that Ivar was going to get with Astrid. But, hmm, this, I, we might be seeing the beginning, once again, excuse me, of a, we might be beginning of seeing a, a Ube Astrid pairing. We might be. Because Michael Hurst did say that Ube has a lot in common with Ragnar. It seems that of all Ragnar's kids, let's be honest here, Ivar inherited Ragnar's intelligence, Vixer inherited Ragnar's arrogance, lightheartedness, Sigurd. You could say the justice and morality part of Ragnar. But Ube and all sense of purposes, especially with the farming, the loyalty, and just the regular practical things, whatever, he's more similar to Ragnar. The most similar to Ragnar out of all his sons, even Bien. And Astra seemed like she's being groomed to sort of be the next Lagatha. So I think that's why I feel as though, especially with their interaction, that they might be paired at some point. And Ivar might just be with Margaret. But yeah, um, 
I think that's pretty much it in regards to that particular storyline. So let's get to the good shit. King Ekbert, Ragnar, Ivar, and Aether Wolf. So we have Ragnar and Ivar, just like last week. They're standing outside of King Ekbert's villa. And the archer's like, who are you? Ragnar's like, I'm a good friend of the king. And they're saying, well, the king ain't here, bro. Ragnar's like, I'm still a good friend of the king. And he will want you guys to let me in. So they let Ragnar in with Ivar. And we see Aetherwolf. And Aetherwolf's like, oh, the great Ragnar Lothbrook. And everyone's just looking at Ragnar. Like, they kind of remember him, but he kind of seemed like a stranger. You know, then again, it has been a few years. So maybe a lot of these people that's in here, you know, wasn't old enough to remember, wasn't around during that whole, you know, during the season two, even season three frame of things. And then it was like, what are you guys doing? Seize him. And they proceed to beat the shit out of Ragnar. And once again, Ivar has to watch this. This is part of their plan. He has to watch it. And... It was really kind of creepy and weird the fact that ate the wolf just his laughter during this while this is going on, you know, it was just really felt uncomfortable, especially watching Ivar his look. You just seeing Ivar getting more angry and angry, building and building and building. So the next thing we we see Ragnar literally wake up in a cage. And then we see Aetherwolf say, you know what? I don't like you. And once again, that was a reference to season three, I believe episode four, when after they defeated the Mercian army that was led by Queen K, Queen K's um, uncle and her little brother, they had this party and Aetherwolf was trying to get, was trying to befriend Ragnar like he apparently did with Rolo. Ragnar was like, you know what? I don't like you. So in a way, it was kind of like an insult referencing back to that time frame. And Ragnar's like, where is my son? And Aethelwolf's like, you know what? I'm not going to tell you because that doesn't matter. We know he was on the sh- We know you had a fleet with you. And most of the shipwrecked were the rest of them. Ragnar's like, I killed them. And he's like, I don't believe you. He's like, I killed them. There's no one left except me and my son. Now, once again, where is my son? He's and Once again, it's like, it doesn't matter. And then Ragnar's like, don't you have sons? And Aethel was like, listen, how would you know? You are an animal, and that's why you're locked up in this cage. So the next thing we see Ekbert coming back from Repton. Repton's in Mercia. So he has to come back from Mercia, and Aethel was all gay like a little kid, said, Father, I got Ragnar Lothbrok. And then Ekbert has no time for this. Ekbert's like, where is he? And then when they get to um to the downstairs part of his kingdom, whatever, the cell which Ragnar is held, he's like, yo, leave. And Aether Wolf leaves. And he's and he looks at Ragnar, he's like, What took you so long? The next scene after that, we have Ragnar and Eckbert pretty much, you know, at the table trying to eat while well, Eckbert's eating. Ragnar not really eat, not really eating anything. Ekbert's saying, why aren't you eating? And Ragnar's like, I haven't seen my son in days. I want to know if he's a, if he's alive and if he's safe. So Ekbert brings Ivar. The soldiers bring I Ek, well, the soldiers bring Ivar. And Ivar's sings little chair. And Ryan's like, you know what? I won't eat until my son has something to eat. And Ekbert's like, he's also our guest. So he gives Ivar, I believe, a rib. And Ivar's eating. eating and Ragnar asks Ivar, how's he doing? Ivar said, I'm doing well compared to you. <laughs> and eventually, Ekbert sort of tells, uh, tells him to take Ivar away. And Ivar says, you know, in the North language, he's like, don't fuck with them. And Ragnar laughs. And then King Ekbert's like, what did he say? And Ragnar's like, oh, he said, thank you. And we saw that smirk from Ekbert. I think Ekbert knew exactly what Ivar said, because let's be re- let's remember, Ekbert was taught um the, the Nordic language by by Athelstan seasons ago. So anywho, Ekbert says to Ragnar, essentially, he mentions Magnus, 
Magnus comes, and just his mannerisms, the, the kid they got to play, um, Quinn K's son, he nailed it perfectly. The mannerisms, like the talking, like just, just the. It was it. He, he was really the male version of Queen K. He nailed that part down. But it was fucked up. Ragnar said, "It's a miracle your birth, because I never slept with your mother. All she did was piss on me <laughs> to heal my wound. That's all she did." So that makes him leave, and Ekra's like, you know what? I always knew that it wasn't your kid. She Queen K did get her. <laughs> so he asks Ragnar once again, why'd you come back? And Ragnar said that this is a part of a larger and bolder strategy. Which had King Eckbert laughing nonstop, saying, Once again, oh I missed you. You mean he had that. Especially with his life, like, once again, always thinking, my Ragnar. So, once again, next thing they have is pretty much King Ever mentions to Ragnar that, you know what, I don't like to see you locked up in a cage. And he has the key, and he shows Ragnar the key. He's like, what would you do if I unlocked the door or the cage? Ragnar's like, I would kill you. <laughs> and Eckbert's like, and then Eckbert, once again, sort of swings the key, uh, you know what I mean, in his way, and he's like, or not. You are all powerful. You control everything. <laughs> and then, you know what I mean? And then Eckbert's just kind of laughing. And Ragnar says to him, he's like, you enjoy the power, don't you? You love it. You crave it. You know what I mean? Because remember, it's sort of like, um, there. once again, there's a lot of season three references in this episode. And two for that matter. Um, he says, I believe Eckbert says, you know what? Power helps me do, you know, lots of the good thing, the things that has to be done. Give me, I'm, not, I'm sorry. Power helped me accomplish all the good things that need to be done. Since I have, you know, become, you know, essentially he has united all the small squabbling kingdoms of England. So pretty much to stop all the opponents wars and all this shit to pretty much stop, I mean, pretty much be able to fortify to attack I mean, to attack other um, possible invaders that could come their way. And Ragnar's like, so, like me. And Eckbert's like, last time I recall, you were not an invade. You were not a hostile type of, you know, enemy. You just wanted a settlement, farmland for your people. That's what I recall. And Ragnar's like, well, and you thought you had the brilliant idea of killing off my people, thinking I was just going to let that slide? And Eckbert's like, you know what? I'll admit, it was the right idea at the wrong time. And once again, I've told you that was one of my deepest regrets. And then Ragnar says to him, stop lying to yourself. Like, stop lying to yourself, dude. Be honest for once. Eventually, Eckbert says to Ragnar, he's like, you know what? To most of the people here in this villa, in the outside world, you are the most dangerous man on this earth. And still, Eckbert, after he flips the table, unlocks Ragnar. I will unlock the cage door. And he kind of falls back a bit. And we see Ragnar Trying to exit that cage like how he exited that little coffin who was in in season three, episode ten. Um, the episode was entitled "The Dead," when he faked his death and was able to let you mean take Queen, uh, take Princess Gilda by the neck and sort of use her as bait in order to let the other Vikings in to sack Paris. So Ragnar, literally before he can do the deed, due to the beating he took wasn't quite able to do what he wanted. He fell flat on his back. And I believe at this point, King Eckbert pours himself a wine, thing of wine and he gives right now the whole thing, the whole big ass container of wine. And then he said, we have a lot to talk about. So this is where this episode really starts to take a, starts to really add more to the epicness. And 
they're talking about the gods. Right? And I said, what if the gods don't exist? And Ekra's like, what are you talking about? And Rana's like, my God, your gods. But they don't exist. And then Ekra's like, my dear friend, come on now. If God or the gods didn't exist, then that would make things meaningless. Like, it wouldn't be real. It would be valueless. And you could do what you want, what you like without any type of conscience or fear of con- or fear of damnation for your soul. And Ragnar's like, what did Ragnar say, actually? So, so much in this particular scene. Ragnar's like, if they don't exist, then they don't exist. And then King Ackman's like, well, that's easy for you. He said, your people is so incorrigible. All you Vikings thinking about is the day of your death or how you're going to die. And then Ron is like, oh, you should be the last one talking. All you guys talk about is heaven where everyone's all good together and all that. It sounds so ridiculous. <laughs> and King, and King Apple is like, oh, I know you're not talking. He was like saying, let's be honest here. At Valhalla, all you guys do is literally fight each other all day, all night kill each other over and over and over again, and then you guys have supper, and then you guys do it all over again. And at this point, they're all, they're both fucked up, and they just sit inside a post, and they're like, and then Ryan's like, the point is, all this religious BS, despite the, despite, you may be right about the whole necessity of it, is ridiculous. It's all ridiculous. It's only there to basically keep societies together and to stop the, you mean, the evils of man, essentially. And then we get into this conversation about Athelstan. And Eckbert mentioned that Athelstan was a man of God. And Rana's like, yeah, he was a man of God, but now he is dead. And Eckbert asks Rana, how did he die? No, we didn't ask. He's like, tell me, how did he die? And Ragnar said, Floki killed him. And then Eckberg is like, well, I see that your gods killed him. Ragnar's like, no, our gods didn't kill him. Floki killed Athelstan out of jealousy because I loved him more than I loved Floki. And then Eckberg retorts, he's like, you see, in a way, I kind of felt how Floki felt because when Athelstan left with you, I felt a part of myself was taken away with Athelstan. You know? And Ragnar's like, it's not my fault that, you know what I mean? Wait, what did he say before that? But he was saying that if Athelstan, well, Ekra said, if Athelstan was with me, he would have been protected. He wouldn't have died. And Ragnar's like, who were you to say that to be the case? Athelstan had enemies here like he did over there, over where we lived, you know, over in Scandinavia. And Eckbert at this point is saying, listen, now who's the one truly lying to themselves now? It's, and then Ragnar retorts saying, you know, you don't have to deal, you mean I have to deal with his death on a daily basis. His death is on my conscience. It's not my fault, I mean, that he loved me more than you. You know what I mean? And once again, Ekber says, once again, Ragnar, who's lying now? So, and then he says after that, which um, when he was, like, the whole thing with Ragnar saying that Athelstan's death's going to consequence, uh, I mean, Athelstan's death's on his conscience, Ekber says, so will yours, because earlier in, the, in this, in their little, um, speech with each other, though, conversation, Ragnar mentioned the fact that the seer said that when he see that Ragnar's going to die when he sees the blind man. And he says, Ekbert has to kill him. Ekbert has to do it. And it was a real powerful scene after this because Ragnar ha- sees Athelstan's son, Alfred the Great. And he's sitting side by side with Ekbert as equals. Once again, another reference to season three. And Ryan was sitting side by side at Eckbert during the party. 
And they were talking about power and corruption and all that shit. Rodney sees Athelstan and Judas with, I mean, I'm sorry, Alfred. And Judas with Alfred, she introduces, she says to Rodney has been a long time, saying that, you know, that she, has, she hasn't seen him in a long time, that she's on to see him. And Rodney says he already knows that's Athelstan's son. He just could, uh, he can sense it and just feels it. It was a really touching scene, you know, Ragnar in a way, like the previous episode, he said his goodbyes, you know, to everyone, Lagtha, Bjorn, Floki, he had his speech that was necessary, you know, with Ekbert to try to understand each other, the reason why they did the shit they did, the regrets and all that, and he finally sees the son of his best friend. In a way, this was kind of like the closing of the book. Except he has to see Ivar last, so obviously close it. But yeah, there's a little scene with him hugging, embracing Alfred. And Alfred was smiling during this as well. So we have another scene in which Eckbert's praying to the God, um, praying to God. And he says one thing, it was a really great speech, by the way, but the last thing sort of hit me in which he said, it's like, which I'm going to paraphrase, obviously, that with more wisdom comes more sorrow. And after this, he speaks with Ragnar, and he says to Ragnar, I know you want me to do it, but I can't do it because it'll be on my conscience. And let's think about it. Ekber has done the most despicable things throughout the season, in which, especially in season 4A, after he betrayed Queen K. That was kind of like, I believe, one of the, that was the thing which Ekber really started to see, like, how much betrayal and stuff and the guilt was really starting to get to him, which led to that epic scene in which he told God, which was in that same chapel, which I mentioned earlier, which he's told God, you know what, your kingdoms of this world, I mean, of, of, <clears throat> of heaven, but my kingdom is here on the earth. So I have to do what I have to do in order to, you know, do what I got to do. But he says to right now, I can't do it. Um, you know, it'll be on my conscience, like you mentioned before. And Ragnar says, okay, then give me to King Ayla. But I need you to promise that nothing, no harm comes to my son Ivar. He doesn't pose any threat. I want you to send him home so that we can tell my other sons what happened. Because you do know that regardless, my sons are coming back and they will tear this motherfucker down, essentially. And they will tear the lungs out of anyone that stands in their way, or everyone for that matter. And Ekber at this point is kind of sh kind of shook, but still still firm. And he's like, I don't doubt that at all. And he's like, in return, Ragnar said that you know what, we're friends, right? He's like, yes. Ragnar says, in return, I'll tell Ivar to make sure, tell him that you did everything in your power. To, you know, you did everything in your power to prevent this from happening. Um, you did everything in your power, you know, to stop this, but you you had no control. And they're gonna put all their anger, and frustration, you know, put, throw it all out on King Ayla, etc. That's the promise. So that's the deal they essentially made. And at this point, King Ekber still doesn't want to do this. And he, has, and he has his hands tied up and they're put together. But Ragnar, in a really powerful scene, probably, probably the best scene in the whole fucking series, now that I think about it, he loosens Ekber's hands, puts his hands on top of his hands, and then you have this close-up shot. You see Ragnar's shiny-ass blue eyes. And it wasn't like he was just saying it to Ekbert. It was like him saying it to the audience as well. Like, because we all, you know, because Ragnar's such an awesome character, you know, Past four years, we all built a bond with him. But it was like he was saying, Eckbert and the audience, like, don't be afraid. This has to happen. Nothing lasts forever. I've done all that I've could done. I mean, I've done all I've, I've accomplished so much. All this, I mean, all this and that. But it's my time to go. And I believe that was pretty much the last scene of this episode. So later on today, I'm going to talk about 
the Vikings season four B episode fifteen review. And it seems as though King Ale is going to play a significant role in that episode. But yeah, thank you guys for watching this video. Like the video if you can. Subscribe to my channel. Write some comments down below. I enjoy, I enjoy talking to you guys. And once again, this is your boy, Josh Vision. And have an awesome day.